Hi, everyone. Thank you again for coming today. Can we get a round of applause for this morning so far? This has been a pretty cool event. So, um, My name is Jamie Mulligan. I work for Kaiser Permanente in our government relations area. I've been working on drug pricing for a few years now, um, and I've had the privilege to meet a lot of you in this room and to collaborate on, on issues around, around drug pricing. And I think what's great about this particular panel is that we have an opportunity to bring together some of the amazing experts in this field to give us a deeper dive on why is this happening? And I think that there's a lot of reasons, obviously, and there's only so much we're gonna be able to get through in the period of time for this panel. Um, but again, we're very excited to be joined by all of you here today. So just to do a little bit of bio introduction, uh, to my immediate left is uh, Dr. Peter Bach, who I'm sure many of you know. Uh, Peter's the director of Memorial Sloan Kettering's Camp Center for uh, Health Policy and Outcomes. Uh, through the Drug Pricing Lab, he and his team educate policymakers, healthcare professionals, industry officials, and patients on drug development and pricing. He served as a senior advisor to the administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and also served as a chair of the CMS expert panel that developed quality measures for cancer hospitals. He's currently the vice chair of the CMS Medicare Evidence Development and Coverage Advisory Committee. He holds a bachelor's from Harvard, a medical degree from the University of Minnesota, and a master of applied positive psychology from the University of Chicago. Just past Dr. Bach, we have Dr. Steve Pearson. Um, Steve, uh, Dr. Pearson is the founder and president of the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, ICER an independent nonprofit organization that evaluates the evidence on the value of medical tests, treatments, and delivery system innovations to encourage collaborative efforts to improve patient care and control costs. Prominent among its evidence reports are ICER reviews of new drugs that include full assessments of clinical and cost effectiveness, along with suggested value-based price benchmarks to inform policymakers and guide price and coverage negotiations. Steve is a lecturer in the Department of Population Medicine at Harvard Medical School, and he also serves as a visiting scientist in the Department of Bioethics at the National Institutes of Health. And immediately to Dr. Pearson's left, we have Professor Fiona Scott Morton. Fiona is a professor of economics at the Yale University School of Management, where she has been on the faculty since 1999. Her area of academic research is an empirical industrial organization with a focus on studies of competition. From 2011 to 2012, Fiona served as the Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Economics at the Antitrust Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, where she helped enforce the nation's antitrust laws. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Yale and a Ph.D. from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Thank you all again so much for joining us. Uh, what we're gonna do to kick off this conversation is um, each panelist will have about three to five minutes to talk about some introductory thoughts on the subject matter. And I think we're actually gonna kick it off uh, with Fiona. Thank you very much uh, for coming everybody and thanks to the organizers for uh, the invitation to speak. I have just two slides. Um, I was asked to talk about the root causes of this uh, pharma pricing problem and so I want to spend my time uh, on those concepts. So the, why do we have such high prices in the United States? First of all, the government does not engage in price regulation. We let the free market determine prices. And that works really well for things like bread and cars and so on. Why doesn't it work well? Why doesn't it work well for drugs? Uh, because the physician makes the choice between drugs. Uh, you make a choice between a Ford and a Honda. Your doctor makes a choice between drugs. And as we heard on the last panel, most often the doctor doesn't even know the price of the drug uh, that he or she is selecting. And moreover, if they did know the price, it would be specific to just one person because the next patient who comes in has a different PBM or different insurer and faces different net prices. So that's a really hopeless situation for the physician unless, for example, they work for Kaiser, in which case somebody has already worked all of this out and gives them uh, the formulary with the lowest price. And they only see Kaiser patients. 
Then secondly, we move to the patient who's the final consumer. That person's usually insured. What does that mean? They either pay a price of zero or some fixed amount like a $20 copay or even a list price. You might have a high deductible plan, a $1,000 deductible, and you go to the drugstore and your EpiPen has a list price of $600 even though your PBM is paying $250 for that drug. None of those is a market price the way you would experience the price of your Ford automobile being a market price. How do we try to fix this in the U.S.? We had some success, I would say, 15 years ago with PBMs as shoppers who gather a large group of patients and move them around in response to the price, and that, for reasons I'll discuss, uh, is no longer working very well. So we just really don't have uh, shoppers who respond to price and quality the way they do for bread or for cars. And then you don't get prices uh, that make any sense if you're not in that world. Why now? Why are we having this conference now and not, say, five years ago? Uh, I think there are several reasons, and they're listed on this slide. And these reasons all have been driving us toward higher list prices and actually higher net transaction prices also. First is the reason that Tony uh, mentioned in the introduction, fragmentation and innovation. Uh, if, I have a, if I'm a large pharmaceutical company with a big portfolio, I understand that if I raise all the prices in my portfolio, the cost of medical care goes up and I have to go testify on Capitol Hill about why my drug's so expensive. If I'm a little biotech startup with one drug, my bonus payment and my buyout and my equity value depends on how much I can extract from the buyer, uh, the big pharma buyer of my little drug. So those, uh, those small firms uh, charge extortionate prices because they only have one drug and they uh, free ride on the rest of the industry by causing conferences like this to happen. Uh, the design, well, they are. I mean, they are a lot of the problem, and, and there are, you'll see that the large firms in this space are, are actually somewhat more constructive uh, because they understand that they would like the free market pricing of their drugs to last as long as possible, and, you know, if every drug is a half a million dollars, we can't keep going down the road we're on. Uh, the design of Part D makes the catastrophic region uh, profitable. That leads to higher list prices. The protected classes, uh, where every drug must be purchased, it gives a buyer no bargaining power to shift share around. The biologic market share is growing, and we have tiny amounts of biosimilar entry in this country compared to, say, Europe. We also have tactics in the biosimilar uh, area that are entry deterrents, and these have been defeated largely in the small molecule area, but they're now reappearing in, in, the, bio, in the biologics area without uh, a government response. So pay for delay, loyalty rebates, and other uh, uh, kinds of abuses um, that uh, reduce competition. And then... Uh, I'll talk about generics and then come back to PBM consolidation because that's the hardest one. Uh, generics, actually, part of the reason we've had some high-priced generics lately in this country is that the generics were actually price-fixing. They were agreeing uh, among themselves to divide up customers and not, uh, not engage in price competition. That's illegal under the antitrust laws. The states have uh, 48 states are pursuing uh, those manufacturers, and they will get in trouble. So those generic prices will come back down again. Uh, uh, Scott Gottlieb at the FDA is trying to reduce time to market for generics, and that's also very promising. And then the big problem is that buyer I mentioned on the previous page, uh, the PBM. We've had a lot of PBM consolidation. I think that has reduced competition between PBMs, and it's turned the PBM to a less good agent for the final client. And that less good agent uh, is doing things like Instead, of when the product hop arrives and the extended release uh, arrives and every, all the doctors move their patients to the extended release, when the generic comes out, the PBM should move everybody back to the generic. That's what happens at the LHMO. I'm sure that's what Kaiser does. But if you're a PBM and you can extract a big rebate from the brand, you don't really have quite the incentive to move everybody back onto the generic. And that, that big rebate should be in a perfectly competitive market, return to the final customer and the PBM wouldn't, wouldn't respond to it. But if you don't have enough competition, the PBM might be responding to that rebate. So we're seeing a lot of vertical mergers now with PBMs that I think is partially in response to this problem. And then why are consumers getting particularly worked up about this now? And it's salient. Many consumers now have high deductible plans. So when the list price goes up and you're actually paying list price in the deduc deductible, you have anti-insurance. Okay, so the idea of insurance, right, is to lower your out-of-pocket costs when you get sick. That's the idea. So that, so that your, your expenses are smooth over time, whether you're healthy or sick. 
When the list price of an EpiPen is $600 and the market price of an EpiPen is $250 and you're sick and you have a high deductible plan, you're not paying the market price. You're not paying a subsidized price because you have insurance. You're paying double the market price in the deductible. So insurance is actually causing you to pay more for medical care. And that's actually not what insurance is supposed to be doing. And so consumers, I think, are reacting uh, to that problem. So that's, uh, that's uh, the setup. That's why we have a problem. And that's why the problem has become particularly uh, acute right now. Thank you. All right, that, that was a great in introduction. Um, I think it's also uh, helpful, I'll emphasize, uh, you know, several of those, but it's also interesting just to reflect that when you talk to state Medicaid programs and to purchasers, this isn't the nature of the problem, this is the way that they feel it. It's just that healthcare costs overall are back to growing faster than the national economy. And it's growing faster than the, the profits of companies. And so it's just creating tremendous tension not just within the healthcare system about how to, you know, use resources and, and, and you know, as wisely as possible, but it's, you know, it's looking at the state medic, at the state budgets and seeing what's being stripped out of education and every other line item in order to feed the healthcare beast. And mixed with that, then people look under the hood and they see pharmaceutical costs, the spending overall, seeming to rise more quickly than many of the other costs. We're just on the tail end of the hepatitis C era in which every purchaser and, and insurer in the country, maybe for the first time in years, had C-suite discussions about drug pricing and drug costs. And so now that's where the searchlight has pivoted and people are wrestling with both what is causing it but also obviously what they can do about it in this broader context of the growing sense that there's not enough money for the system and then obviously how that trickles down to influence the, the impact on individual patients. So within that, I think there's also been a growing sense. We can talk about the problem of prices, but there's a growing sense that we have a fantastic ecosystem, if you will, for innovation. But when we get drugs at the end of the day, we often have had a hard time really figuring out when we're getting a great value based on their price and when we're not, when we're getting ripped off. We've had no national approach to this, as, as Fiona mentioned. So that just makes everybody even less comfortable with the status, status quo. So back to my short story of how kind of the nature of how this builds on itself. We have a great ecosystem with fantastic innovation in this country, the ability to raise capital, to get uh, the merits, or the, I should say the fruits of basic science research handed off to you, the ability to do clinical research. This is the best place in the world to do all of that. And at the end of that stream, you get a monopoly on your product. And that gives you tremendous, obviously, on paper pricing power to start off with. Then you twin that with the idea that the pricing is not regulated. And regulation is an ugly word in many quadrants of, of Washington, but it basically means that the government is a price taker. And if you honestly asked most people on the street and you told them a story of how your federal government basically turns around and says, how much do you want me to pay you for this? they would find that a bizarre way to run anything <laughs> in terms of a market system to say, how much can I pay you for this? You get to tell me. So we are price takers and linked to that again because we have no national infrastructure for it. Um, we have had a l relative lack of authoritative information even to guide private purchasers in thinking uh, kind of systematically about the value that they're getting. Then on the private payer side, they get handed off drugs with a, you know, with a potentially very high list uh, price at launch, and they have limited negotiating tools. Um, they have to cover in many ways through legal kind of uh, requirements that they cover many or most new FDA drugs in one way or the other. Um, their patients certainly want access to these drugs. And to be fair, the payers are part of a private market system too. They don't want to blow it up. They don't want to say, we can't do this, we need a single payer. That's the only way forward. You're not going to hear that from the health plan industry. They don't want to blow it up. They don't want to enrage their customers. They don't want to enrage the physicians. So they try to make do, um, but the revenues you know, keep going up. If you know, drug companies are making more, it costs more for premiums. Health plans have higher revenue. So it's hard to figure out how to cut, cut that chain. The other piece about 
the limitations on payers is that they have moved heaven and earth over the last 10 years or so to try to figure out how to share the financial risk around physician and hospital services on the, on the commercial side. And they feel like they've got levers to push, conversations to have with hospitals and physicians, not always wholly successful, but conversations to have about how do we share the accountability for the costs and how do we share in the savings that we can produce while improving quality. You can't have that conversation with your fee-for-service drug company pill provider. It doesn't work that way for them. So again, payers feel like they can't draw them into that uh, kind of culture of trying to seek shared savings. The last thing that I think is kind of interesting is if you talk to folks in the pharmaceutical industry, of course, there's a huge spectrum. We should never consider them all one type of animal. CEOs differ, internal company cultures differ. Um, but what I've heard from many of them is that if you've been in the business long enough, it feels really different today than it did 15 years ago. Many will tell you that it feels now that the average CEO tenure is two to three years as opposed to 10. That their focus on the near-term revenue and profit stream is enhanced by all of the features of their compensation and share price that I know you've heard some about today. And that there used to be, of course we all look back to the golden era, but folks, some folks in farm will say there was a golden era where we actually got it. That there was a social contract that we were given power with the monopoly to price, and we were required to exercise restraint in order to keep the access and the overall costs in check. They say that's changed. Now, whether it's, again, their problem and they need to sort it out or whether it's a, a systemic problem, I just think it's important to realize that their ecosystem now drives a very different set of decisions around pricing than it used to um, not Know, all that long ago. So that's my brief take on some of the kind of core underlying features, um, and I highlighted a few, obviously, that Fiona already mentioned. Peter? Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, you haven't left me much to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> There's just a few problems. Um, let me emphasize a few things. So getting to this, so Fiona mentioned the, if you will, the free market or the marketplace setting prices. Steve also mentioned this, and I'm going to come back to some of these. but. One of the challenges, I think, in looking at this space and looking at pricing and uh, is, is trying to get some reckoning whether or not this primary claim that the prices that we're paying for many of these new drugs are in line or out of whack. And that's actually not whack WAC for all of you nerds, by the way. Uh, um, the, and, you know, it's challenging. And so we've actually been trying to look at this problem. So we, you know, track things like cancer drug price launches. And I can tell you adjusted for inflation, new drug launch in the cancer market are up. Prices are about up about 100-fold since 1965, adjusting for everything else, like standard dosing and stuff like that. And that doesn't even include the CAR-Ts, which, you know, are, again, off the charts. Um, and, you know, that kind of trend makes you start to worry. We and others have done a bunch of work trying to look at those prices and see, like, can we figure out if those align with the rising prices align with other things that you would be willing to pay for, like uh, life prolongation or something like that. And every analysis we've done and others have done uh, show the same general pattern, which is that the prices are rising out of proportion to any measure of what that uh, drug is buying. In cancer, the prices have risen about 5x with respect to the survival benefits new drugs provide. Some of the work that uh, ICER has done around the uh, lipid-lowering drugs uh, shows pretty clearly that if you go back to the, the heydays of Lipitor, the old days of pharma, if you will, the restraint days, they looking at the branded prices of Lipitor and other statins back when they launched compared to the new PCSK9s. There's about a 10x difference in price relative to the magnitude of the benefit, or if you will, the LDL lowering of those drugs. And actually across the sector, we just see these general price increases out of proportion to value. And we've done other work trying to say, like, okay, maybe we can find some other variable that explains it, and you just can't. And so there's something sort of out of balance. And the other thing is it's hard to look at European prices and not scratch your head. And now the farm industry is fond of saying, oh, that's price controls. 
Uh, you know, so that's different. That's sort of un-American, of course. Uh, but the but it's actually not, that's just, if you will, a label. It actually doesn't describe most of the European markets accurately at all. Most countries negotiate and they act as collective purchasers. And the deal is not, Pharma will say, well, they'll, they'll just compulsorily license our product if we don't agree to a price. That, that is mostly a boogeyman. Uh, there are not a lot of examples of compulsory licensing from Europe and the context of them were in, were in the setting of anti-competitive behavior, not price negotiation. But nevertheless, it's sort of interesting to look at a country like Ireland, which has just a handful of millions of people paying lower prices for essentially every branded product than we do as the US, in the US purely through negotiation. It's got like four or five million inhabitants. Express Scripts has 80 million covered lives, 20x the number, and can't achieve the same prices. So something, you look at those things and it's sort of out of whack. And you could say, well, Ireland, you know, they'll compulsorily license. It turns out Ireland is a major home of biotech and pharma. So they actually have an entire industry they depend on from a tax base perspective that they're probably not going to be quick to alienate. So it's actually kind of an interesting window into what could be achieved if there were actually serious negotiation going on. Um, so those are the kind of things that tell you, suggest that there's problems in the pricing. And then the consequences here, most of the data suggest actually that access even amongst the insured is poorer here than it is in most European countries. If you look at cancer drugs, which is where I tend to focus, you just look at the population of diagnosed cancer patients with respect to the sort of volume of prescribed cancer drugs for them. We rank lower than the other major economies in the country or in the world. Uh, we still rank, even though the penetration of that population is lower, we still rank way higher per diagnosed cancer patient in terms of spending on cancer drugs. And as Fiona mentioned, uh, our tools for dealing with these prices are intrinsically problematic. Uh, from a number of perspectives. I try to look at this thing as a doctor at an innovative biomedical research institution that provides care, hopefully cutting edge, to patients with cancer. And so I look at this portfolio of cancer drugs that's coming along. It's very exciting. There's been some disappointments as well, but we're all very excited about CAR-T and IO and things like that. And then I look at the insurance products that we offer people for these treatments, and we generally say, well, okay, nobody else, the PBMs with 80 million covered lives can't solve this problem, so we'll let individual patients with advanced cancer deal with it instead. So we'll stick them with a $5,000 deductible, and maybe they'll solve this pricing problem because, you know, the nation's PBMs cannot, and neither can the federal government. And the problem with that are many fold, but the first is that I thought the purpose of innovation and investment was to create products that could help people. So I don't think that a system that creates financial barriers to accessing that help makes a lot of sense, or at least is cogent with this larger objective. But the other problem, as Fiona mentioned, is that high deductible plans, I disagree, by the way, that's anti-insurance, and I'll say why, but, but high deductible plans are intrinsically regressive. And equity, I think, is still a value that probably many people hold, particularly when so much of this is uh, research and the reimbursement for drugs is supported by tax dollars. So on this uh, anti-insurance question, it's true that because of the way drugs are priced that patients often pay list price, but I actually think we, we are struggling with a more basic question of what insurance should do for us. And we live in this hybrid world of insurance is essentially a subscription plan to the health economy, where in which case Fiona is right that you know this is a, a crummy aspect of the subscription if my first fee is five thousand dollars, but you could also view it as a pure catastrophic benefit, and that is the frame through which high deductible plans come through. And so people would spend a lot of money to then access very low cost of subsequent subsequent care. By saying I disagree that it's anti-insurance doesn't mean I embrace the high deductible model. I just think that what we're really caught in here is, do we think of insurance as a low cost subscription to the entire healthcare bucket? Or do we think of it just as kind of an airbag for truly catastrophic spending? And that bifurcation actually characterizes, I think, a lot of the policy debate that's going on around the general structure of insurance. Let me just, uh, I appreciate that. And, and I understand what you mean. My, my Concerned about the reason I call it anti-insurance is a high deductible is often 
promoted as something that lets the consumer shop with her dollars and be responsible for her spending and figure out who the low-cost doctor is and the low-cost drug and so on. So then to tell that patient, well, you're supposed to shop, but we're going to give you prices that aren't market prices. They're going to be the list price that nobody pays. Uh, and that's the price that you shop with. Then, then it kind of makes a mockery of that whole um, let let market prices help people, uh, you know, be responsible under their deductible. Oh, so no, I would we, I would no, rather are. see patients be able to shop among, say, EpiPen prices that were close to real market prices. That's all. That's we all. don't. I mean, I didn't. I agree. I mean, high deductible plans are crap. You know, so that part I agree on, and they don't have these market of forces. And like I said, I really don't think using individual cancer patients who are facing all these other problems to deal with prices when these big purchasers won't is a great solution. In fact, it's the opposite of that. And I mean, they're also designed for wealthy people and then sold to poor people. So it's, you know, it's great for, you know, high income earners like physicians, like I can like invest my, my, um, my HSA in, in the market. Great. But it's, that's, it's not designed for, that's not who we're selling these things to. So let's talk a little bit more about money. Um, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that, I mean, I, again, thank, thank, all, thank all of you for, for your sharing just now because I, I think it really puts, it really puts into clear relief just how complex this area can be. Um, so there's there's actually two questions that I have, and, and any one of you who have a take, um, feel free. Uh, the first is um, uh, if anyone has additional thoughts on the incentives specifically that the decision makers at the pharmaceutical companies are dealing with, um, and um, you know the, the the two to three year cycle uh, of of being in a leadership position, and then the way the compensation works, and any other thoughts on what a what that might look like in, in terms of why that shift happened um in any any predictions in that area and then just uh due to time the second question that i would love for for you all to mull is if you were talking to a policymaker and you could really only dig in on one part of of why we are where we are what would be the thing that you would lead with either because you think it's something that there isn't enough attention paid to or because you think it's really one of the most critical aspects of the whole conversation. And I know those are two kind of big questions, so I don't know if anyone's willing to volunteer themselves as tribute to go first. Can I go? Yeah. Yeah, so actually, I, I, it doesn't surprise me that the general uh, erosion, if you will, of this long-term social contract in the industry is, is occurring, that you know, the benevolence doesn't generally uh, persist when uh, too much power is concentrated. But I actually think the, the primary aim should be on all of the entities that are feeding additionally at the trough. And I'm not saying that pharma companies are, you know, beyond reproach or anything like that, or I'm, I think that they need the level of profits that they do need to fuel innovation. But a bigger problem is that Essentially, the entire system is geared towards proportional profit increases yes. when drug prices rise. And so even the PBMs, and like everyone, PBMs is everyone's favorite thing to beat on right now, but even the PBM structure ultimately feeds off of this pharmaceutical industry. And so, fine, they keep, you know, they get the bigger rebates they get, they get to keep some of it, maybe about 11 percent, then there's these other fees, but they just all do better. Even insurers at some level, as long as they can keep premiums, aligned do better, right? The big lament from insurers around Hep C was not how much the treatments cost. It was that they didn't have warning. So they couldn't kind of accommodate premium increases to capture it, and then they have a piece on top of it. You know, doctors and hospitals, including mine, when we administer drugs, we mark them up. We don't get to mark them up at that much into the Medicare program. It's 6 percent, and then it's actually about 4.3 percent with this by statute, but to the commercial, we concentrate market power and average uh, markups for hospitals for infused drugs is more than 100% in the commercial market. 340B hospitals, it's even more. Many of these hospitals will then get specialty pharmacies. The gross profits for the pharmacy industry are about $80 billion this year, just from the moving of drugs. So like everybody, except those who are paying premiums and paying out of pocket, is benefiting from a rising share here. And what we, we need to, policymakers should be thinking about is trying to make this chain, I would prefer neutral, 
rather than adverse, only because I worry about the reverse effect of rationing and not being, making it too hard to manage uh, formulary. But that's actually where policymakers should aim their target, because we need to at least get out of a system where I, as a, I'm not an oncologist, but if I were and I had a choice between a $10,000 drug and a $1,000 drug, I am heavily incentivized to prescribe the $10,000 drug. I would just like to get to neutral on that. Let me just, I would uh, add one interesting thing about what's been emerging around the role of the PBMs and as part of a very opaque system is that, again, the purchaser community, especially the more sophisticated self-insured community, is basically done with that. And they've told their PBMs, we're not doing that anymore. And there's already data that, that shows a huge shift in the contracting between purchasers and PBMs where they're either getting rid of rebates or they're, they're either keeping them all, I should say, or they're paying a small administrative fee. They're really moving away from this model where they don't really know how much rebate's coming in and they get some of it and it's, there are all these other fees. They've got consultants out the back door now telling them how to renegotiate these contracts and kind of sort that out. So the PBMs are looking at a new landscape themselves, but ultimately I think that's one of the sleeping giants in this story is the purchaser community. And again, they often talk a big show, but then at the end of the day, they don't want their single employee to call them up and say, my son or daughter can't get the drug that you know, they want, and what are you doing? So they are always conflicted. But now I'm getting the sense that the purchaser community, there's really reached a tipping point, and that they are willing to think much more aggressively, both with their PBMs, but even outside the PBM uh, in terms of negotiating. So. If I were going to say the one, I think the second part of your question was what's the one thing, um, I do think people have to fundamentally decide in their own minds <clears throat> whether this is a problem that can be solved by fixing competition or not. If it can, you figure out how to speed generics to market. I mean, there's no reason not to do all these things. <clears throat> but you speed generics to market, you get biosimilars in, you maybe you get rid of protective classes, all the things that kind of, if you will, inhibit true uh, power of negotiation. Um, or you decide that no matter what we do, that's not going to work. And like water and electricity, there's going to have to be some kind of public utility approach to saying, at least in certain circumstances, maybe where there is a new drug that faces no competition, we have to have some kind of regulation slash you know, price ceiling, something along the lines of that. And you'll find people obviously focused sometimes much more in one of those camps than the other, but it is a funda fundamental to divide. To me, if I, if I were to say the, the one thing, I would say it's this idea of negotiation. Should Medicare negotiate? How do we, how, you know, to me, you can link that to the idea of making sure that we don't have situations where the market creates every incentive aligned to have a higher price. And again, that's frequently in, in areas where they used, what they used to call unique drugs, where drugs would come in to coverage without, at least for, a, for some time, without any real competition. There you have to have an approach, and this is what the Europeans are the best at, at just saying, okay, great new drug, we want to cover it, but we got to sit down. We have to have some independent approach to judging what a fair price would be in accordance with the value to patients. And we have to look at our budget, by the way, depending if we're Ireland or Switzerland or wherever, and we'll, and we'll negotiate our way through that. So I, I think that ultimately the idea of having information to drive negotiating by states, and we're seeing that in New York. I don't know if you know this, but later this month New York is having its first public meeting of its Drug Utilization Review Board. New York has established a spending cap for drugs within its Medicaid program. They have been exceeding that cap, and so they have a new law passed um, this year that allows them to work with drug makers to target a lower payment than even Medicaid would ask for through supplemental rebates. And if they can't get there, they have a public meeting, and the first one's going to happen in April. It's now been announced. It's a company called Vertex, Cystic Fibrosis Drugs will be on the table. And the question for New York will be, what's a fair price for the state of New York to pay for these drugs? So they are empowered to ask that question. They're empowered to use independent analysis. They're using our report to help get there. And then we're going to see how, what, you know, in a sense, what the dynamic is following that meeting. But there is movement both on the private side and in the state public insurer side 
that I think offers the opportunity for the basic idea of negotiation to really play out in a way that I think will be very, very important. Um, I think negotiation is key, but the way that you have strength as a negotiator is if you're willing to walk away. And that's why the competition piece of this is so important. If there's a, co a competitor drug, I can walk away from a drug that's charging too much. If the cystic fibrosis drug is the only one available and the company doesn't move, is the state of New York willing to say, we're not buying? I don't know. I so can that, tell you what the, what the law Ireland says. Is. What the law says, is, and they've created this new bag of sticks that they can basically reach into and start to club the, the manufacturer. And it includes the most onerous disclosure requirements I've ever seen, disclosing every single price they charge in every market in the world, everything about the development costs, where they got some of the science and other kind of federal investments in, involved. So there are lots of ways. It's still America, so they don't call this price exactly. setting, yep. but they do call it pretty close right. to that right. because of the nature of the so, sticks. So I, I, so I come down on the side of before we move to regulation, let's try actually having competition. Uh, drug companies, I would say, claim that we're in competitive markets, but for the reasons I outlined at the beginning of the panel, I think there are many situations where competition really isn't working. So it's very helpful to have the people who want regulation out there beating the drum really loudly because that makes competition sound more attractive. Uh, to the uh, parties in the marketplace, I think. So I would encourage everybody to advocate for both uh, regulation and competition. Um, I think what Peter said about how every single party along the supply chain gets a percentage of the list price cannot be overstated. If the physician is being paid on percent, if the distributor is being paid on percent, if the retailer is being paid on percent, if the PBM is being paid on percent, then everybody wants a higher price. And that, that's really a problem. Uh, the cost of moving a box of pills around really does not rise with the, uh, with the price of the medication inside. So there are better ways to write those contracts. Um, my one uh, thing that I would uh, focus on is uh, the issue of kickbacks that I asked about uh, earlier today. I think we have a real problem in incentivizing competition between drugs when the consumer is being paid to consume one drug versus another. So let's imagine we have a biologic that's $100,000 and there's a competitor that's $40,000. If I have to pay 30% of the list price either way, I can't afford that. So I send in my tax return to one of them and I get my, and the manufacturer gives me patient assistance and I get $30,000 a year uh, paid so that I'm on this $100,000 drug and my insurer is paying 70. My insurer would like to move me to the $40,000 drug, but I don't want to move because my out-of-pocket costs are zero because the uh, manufacturer of the more expensive drug is paying me to uh, shift a $70,000 bill to my insurer. That's a huge competition problem. If instead we said, look, that manufacturer payment is just disallowed, manufacturers may not give financial assistance to patients, that would allow PBMs to move and, and insurers to move around business. Now then you say, wait, we're exposing the consumer, the patient, to a $30,000 copay. And that's why these rules, I think, need to be combined with a state level, perhaps, cap on out-of-pocket costs. My understanding from PBMs is that people are quite responsive to out-of-pocket costs that range from zero to, say, 200. Uh, so if you wanted a patient to consume the $40,000 medication, that could have a zero out-of-pocket cost to the patient, and the $100,000 drug could have a $195 cost to the patient or a $200 cost to the patient per month, and that's quite salient. Do you want to pay nothing, your free medication, or do you want to pay $200 a month? I think you would get people to shift drugs under those circumstances, and then the insurer is saving $30,000, right, every month uh, by having the patient on the less expensive drug, and actually the more sophisticated last step of that analysis is the economist who says, in equilibrium, the price of that $100,000 drug doesn't stay at 100000 anymore because they've lost all their customers. Uh, they're going to have to come down to 70 or 60 or whatever uh, the competition is charging. So that's the way we get to competition uh, by getting rid of these kickbacks uh, that go to patients.
Thank you so much. So unfortunately, we're actually out of time for this panel. Um, so one thing I did want to say for those of you who are out in the audience with your questions, one major advantage of this event today is that there is a lunchtime. And I believe all of our kind speakers will be here during lunchtime, so feel free to write down your questions. And we also do have a solutions panel this afternoon, because obviously we've begun to excavate a bit here, and you may be wondering what to do next. And I also know that all of these speakers have plenty of ideas in that area. Um, so I, th I think before the actual hook pulls us off the stage, we will uh, transition to the next panel. But can we get a round of applause for our panelists today? Thank you so much. <laughs>